All right. Hello, everyone. Um, Christine Stable Ben and I are back. Um, I'm Tracy Beth Hogue, or who, if you uh, speak Danish. And um, I'm in California right now. I'm an MD, PhD epidemiologist here. And um, Christine Stable Ben is in Denmark right now, I believe. And uh, it's nighttime there. Or it's nighttime here, morning there. So, I'm in uh, Italy, actually. I'm at a oh. convent in Italy, <laughs> and it's six <laughs> o'clock in the morning here. <laughs> I'm a professor Welcome. of global health, and you're absolutely right. Normally, I would be in Denmark uh, at this time, uh, which is my home country, but I'm currently at a writing retreat here in Italy, and this is why, yeah, I'm here for, for this particular podcast, Tracy, and uh, to continue our talks about vaccines and issues related to that. Awesome. Well, I'm so uh, grateful that you woke up so early in the morning, and I'm sorry. <laughs> I'm very <laughs> sorry about that. Um, and I, I'm also, I'm really excited about all the feedback that we're getting for this podcast, because I think one of the things is people really appreciate that we're asking questions that other people aren't asking and sort of willing to delve into the data. I think in way, in, in, in ways that maybe people are unfortunately afraid to do, uh, afraid of repercussions, or, you know, maybe, you know, it's they don't have the background to do it as well. And I think, you know, at least in the United States, our CDC and FDA have not been doing the greatest job about informing us here in the United States about the data. And we've discussed that before about how that, you know, that leads to differences in recommendations by country. Um, and we've we've talked about before in previous episodes how there's about three times as many doses of vaccines recommended for children in the US as in Denmark. And um, so I, you know, it it'll be in I'm very interested to talk about what what, what we're gonna talk about today. I'm gonna be very interested to see how Denmark handles this situation as well. And if anything is done, um, so which situation, I'll, I'll, Tracy? I'll just so the, uh... the, so the situation that we have um, about the possible DNA contamination of the mRNA vaccines. Yeah, so and... let's maybe just introduce that these are our topics for today: the yes. the possible DNA contamination of the COVID vaccines, and then we'll touch upon one of the many differences in the Danish and the U.S. vaccination program, namely the hepatitis B vaccine. Exactly. And I, I want to review, maybe we can start out actually by, um, by reviewing a little bit of what we didn't cover last time um, about the recommendations for the COVID vaccine um, in the United States versus Denmark, because we, we, we got into it a little bit, but at that time, I hadn't seen the data yet. And so I wanted to mention, you know, what we know about the the safety and the efficacy of the um, Pfizer and Moderna vaccines, um, because last time I didn't think I hadn't seen any data yet in humans, but it turned out that Moderna. The You're Moderna, talking about the, the new updated booster. The new monovalent XBB uh, vaccine that you mentioned last time it's being recommended in Denmark for people over 65, for pregnant women um, and for high risk groups if I understand correctly. Correct. And um, and so in the United States, we had the ACIP meeting um, and they're the group that advises the CDC about what to recommend for the United States. And they recommended um, everyone in the United States, six months and older, get the COVID-19 vaccine, which is very different from the rest of the world. I um, I know it's different from all of Europe, different from the EMA, the European uh, CDC, different from the UK, different from Australia, where they're really focusing on over 65, some places over 75, and high-risk groups. Canada, I understand, basically their recommendation is they're focusing on higher-risk groups, but they have it available for everyone six months and older, so there may be a little between the U.S. and Europe. Um, yeah, so U.S. And, is a real outlier. What is the justification for recommending this? Has there been well, any? Yeah. So I, I, they, they basically they're they're doing a risk benefit analysis um, 
where they're they're basically looking at only observational data and they're kind of they're they're relying on on data where there's this passive surveillance of safety signals and then they're looking at potential benefits of the vaccine extra sort of extrapolating either from the original clinical trials or from observational data where we're overestimating or we don't really know the effectiveness of the vaccines because we've got this pervasive healthy vaccine bias in the United States. So people who are healthier tend to get vaccinated and people who are less healthy tend not to. It's and, and people who are dying. That I've seen it's about 70% <laughs> difference in mortality rates, um, non-COVID mortality rates. So um, people just tend to be healthier who are vaccinated. And so they're using data like that in their risk benefit calculations. And then when they're looking at children, they're not subtracting out incidental hospitalizations and deaths like Denmark has been doing for a long time. I mean, I'm even having trouble finding updated Danish data because Denmark is really not testing everyone upon admission and they're really not recommending general population testing of for COVID-19. And in the United don't States, get ill or what? die from the current variants. So that, I mean, that's right. It's, yeah, <laughs> it's it would be very <laughs> difficult to to find any any benefit for children. I mean, particularly for the children, even with the older variants, uh, normal healthy yeah. children do, do not succumb to COVID nineteen in, in any serious way that limit that that justifies vaccination. In, in my view, I, I just, you know, if, if you talk benefit risk, you need to have at least the a prospect of a slight benefit, but this is, and, and and it was never there for children, even in Denmark, when we recommended COVID-19 vaccine for five to 11 year old children for a brief period, the justification was primarily that this was to, to stop the spread of the virus in the community. It was not for the sake of the children. So I just don't get how US can reach such very different well, yeah, and and I'm, yeah, I'm that curious. Over but... half of the children hospitalized from COVID nineteen have a uh, no underlying health conditions, but but again, they're not subtracting out the incidental positives. And you know, I you really get the sense listening and and to to these meetings that they're not being fully transparent or they're not really thinking through the data appropriately. Um, not it seem it's seemingly like unaware of what other countries are doing and recommending mm -hmm. and why, and and so just to review, I mean the data that we have on the new XBB vaccine, um, Moderna did a study in uh, fifty uh, adults uh, over the age of twenty who got the XBB vaccine, and they looked at antibodies uh, fifteen and twenty nine days later. Um, and they were able to show a rise in the antibody response in those that got the XBB vaccine versus those that got the BA4, BA5 bivalent vaccine from last year. And uh, and so they were like, uh, so that that means it works. And they looked at, you know, uh, uh, some of the the new the, the new circulating variants like Eris and the FL variant. And so they 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 said okay well if there's an antibody rise compared to the old vaccine that must mean it it works but they didn't have any clinical outcomes in terms of you know it's a it's too small of a study to have that but they did have uh this one medically attended adverse event among the 50 adults who got it um that was found to be related to the vaccine and moderna didn't disclose what it was and uh, so Marty McCary and I wrote an article about this that was published in the New York Post. People can check that out. Um, so it's really, really like this. They didn't mention that adverse uh, reaction in the ACIP meeting where the CDC recommended it. They kind of glossed over that part. Um, Moderna did. And then Pfizer is basing their data on 10, 10 mice. Mm -hmm. Um and so they're also looking at antibody levels. So really, you know, I, I I know you were invited to this too, but I was advising Ron DeSantis and I said, you know, I I just, I, I, I don't understand how we can recommend a vaccine like, like this, even, even to high risk, because I just, I, I feel, I feel like there's this lack of knowledge. Like we don't, we don't know, we have no way of calculating whether or not the benefits will outweigh the harms. And so 
it was really a, a failure, I think, of the FDA to require some more information, you know, and then also the CDC to really just make this blanket recommendation for everyone. And um, and so it gets back to the our, our other topic that we're going to discuss today about FDA regulation and about what we so in in the United States. Um, so I, I actually almost almost brought this up last time because when we were talking about the immune effects of the vaccine and we were talking about sort of um, side effects that we might not anticipate. And I was aware of Kevin McKernan, who was uh, formerly of MIT. He may still be there, but he basically was the first one. Uh, he's a He's a genomics researcher and his lab was the first to find unexpected, so, uh, contamination of the mRNA vaccines with DNA. And so the way that the DNA got in there, just to bring everyone up to speed, is um, it wasn't in the original clinical trials vaccines, this DNA, but the DNA is a plasmid that was used to so so that more uh, mRNA could be made more quickly so that they could scale up the production of the mRNA vaccines so the entire world could have access to these vaccines. Um, and so what happened was these plasmids uh, remained in, in the vaccine solution, in the vaccination. And Pfizer now apparently, I learned this through this testimony that we had from Phil Buckholz, who's from the University of South Carolina, um, he just testified before the South Carolina Senate, and he's so the story was right, right that he he saw these uh, observations and, and actually set out to uh, disprove them. He didn't think he would find that much DNA. Uh, yes. So, so he, his he hypothesis knew. was <laughs> actually different yes. from the from the starting point. But he discovered exactly the same as as this uh, first person had uh, or investigator exactly, had done. Exactly. Yeah. Exactly. So so. Phil Buckholz, this uh, he has his own lab. He's a full professor at University of South Carolina, very pro-vaccine. He's vaccinated, said he wanted his daughters to get vaccinated. Uh, didn't expect Kevin McKernan to be correct. He got apparently hundreds, it sounds like, of vials of the vaccine um, from a friend who's a, a pharmacist who had kept old vials that had some left at the bottom. Uh, and was able to show that um, there's these this plasma DNA, but not just that. He said, on average, there's 200 billion fragments of plasma DNA in each of the vaccines, he estimates. And, and so the issue is now there are DNA, there is DNA in other vaccines that we give, but that's naked DNA, whereas this DNA is, um, and wrapped in the lipid nanoparticle, the same thing that the mRNA is enwrapped in. Um, and so because of that, it's able to transfect the cells. So it's able to get into the cells inside of the lipid nanoparticle. And once it's inside of the cell, apparently because there's so many fragments, like it actually ends up random, it can, it ends up randomly inserting itself into the DNA um of ourselves say so here, that's, yeah, that's the that's the that's the theory concern, obvious concern yeah for, yeah for, and he says this phil buckholtz dr buckholtz he says that's you know what he did his phd in was he would actually observe this dna sort of uh randomly inserting into the genome once it got into the cell without any extra help just because there was a large amount of it in there. This is how he describes it. So, so his concern now is that it got into the the genome, and then it may be in you know uh, the 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 genome of our stem cells, and it may cause permanent alterations. And so, what he's hoping is is that researchers can figure out by looking at people's stem cells whether the DNA integration has happened. And he's also hoping that Pfizer and the FDA, the FDA can ask Pfizer as well as Moderna to check to see if this DNA contamination 
is in the most the 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 new monovalent vaccine and he is not able to get a response from the FDA which is so so crazy and i just think that's the that's the most disturbing part i i don't know there's so many disturbing parts about this because Pfizer knew that it was in there they tried to break it up that's why it's in all these billions of uniform pieces but they didn't get it out. And he says getting it out is actually quite simple and not very expensive. And so, you know, why was it left in there? Why, why did, why, why did no one notice that it was in there? Why was there this regulatory, you know, um, why, why this, the, the lack of regulatory oversight and um, why is the FDA not responding? And then why um, is <laughs> Facebook censoring people who talk about it. Oh yeah, so there's, it's clear that there's this need for a, a response to this because this is a, a true concern in my view. And I have to say there are many reasons why one shouldn't panic. Uh, and, and to go through them, I think there has probably been quality control of the DNA content, but the issue at stake is whether the level there is um, uh, above the the permitted concentrations and i think the issue is that that level that safety level that had been set for how much dna a vaccine could contain was uh, assuming that the vaccine was injected exactly as you said with uh, directly uh, but not covered in these lip nan nanoparticles yeah. so yeah. so the, it's clear that to me that it's a, one big good question is, well, even if the amount of DNA does not exceed the um, the toxicity levels uh, that are uh, set out for vaccines, these levels may have been set assuming other types of vaccines. And with this new platform with the lipid nanoparticles, that threshold may actually have been set too high. And and so so but 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 I think in the in the first place, maybe um the content isn't that high in itself, but the worrying part we both agree, I think, is that it's now wrapped in lipo, lipo uh, nanoparticles and can enter the cells more directly. Uh, the second thing is once it's in the cytoplasma of the cell, the body also has defense mechanisms to have, you know, if you have foreign DNA in the cells, there will be ways that the cell will normally deal with that. It's, uh, so there are DNAs, uh, as I understand it, in the cytoplasma that will do, do its job to try to cope with this foreign DNA, this plasmid DNA that has now entered the cell. So one big question is, is that sufficient to prevent that there might then next be DNA in the cytoplasma in the cell that then enters the nucleus of the cell, where it's really where our DNA is hidden and uh, kept and where you can have these alterations of your genome in the cell. And that, again, is something I don't think we know very well how much if you have this DNA, small DNA fragments entering the cytoplasma, if they make it into the cell, the, the suspicion of, of Dr. Buchhaus, and I'm not an expert in this area, so I'm I'm really concerned when he's concerned, but his suspicion is one of two, that the DNA could hinge onto places where it could stop the normal uh, the normal features that will hinder cancer development. So it could kind of, you know, take off the brakes of a potential cancer speed up process in the cell. Uh, so, so there's right. a risk of, well, his, one of his suspicions is this could actually cause cancer within two to four to five years. Uh, I mean, if that was an immediate, in my understanding, if this was something that happened in connection with the vaccination, you would see the clinical cancer within a period of five years or so afterwards. I don't think it's like, it would be unlikely that it was a something that happened very long time after, you know, 20 years after vaccination. Do we agree on that? It's, it has, it's something that has to be kicked off kind of quickly well, you know i i don't i don't know i don't know the answer to that if it would be something that would you know we tend to see more quickly or if it would happen longer down the road you know if it's a permanent alteration of the genome i mean i i guess i i don't know i don't know when we, we might see it because many people might know i mean you we we do get actually start 
cancers and our immune system takes care of it and not everything turns into something that you need to deal with. So, you know, I, I mean, I think, I think, you know, the first question is, is it, is it happening? And, you know, I, I don't know. I I've been trying to actually reach out to people that I know to ask them, can, can you do this study? Like who you, who might be able to do it. And, and I was going to say to the listeners of this, like, um, you know, in Denmark, Mark, can Denmark, can someone in Denmark do this study? And, and because I know in the U S it's like, you, you would need an IRB and you would need, um, you know, your institution's approval to do this. And it's a very contentious subject. And so, so let's, I maybe guess... let's, just, let's just finish what uh, the, the yeah. concerns are, and then we can go back to what studies yeah. are needed, because I think that's, we also need to explain that, but I think the second concern, and I think it's, it's, yeah, it just emphasizes that we need to have studies done to to hopefully reassure us that there's no reason for worry, because clearly when the two of, it, of us are sitting here talking about the potential for this vaccine to increase cancer risk, it's a terrible, terrible concern that we need to have cleared away, hopefully as, as quickly as possible. The other concern is that the DNA could lead to production of new antigens that the body doesn't hasn't seen itself and that could then uh, release autoimmune responses where the body starts reacting to its own cells like it's known for rheumatoid arthritis or um, uh, sclerosis or other autoimmune diseases where the body where the disease processes that the body attacks itself so this is the second concern so we have these two major cons or suspicions raised that the DNA could lead to either cancer or autoimmune phenomena, uh, phenomena, and and this is why, as you said, we would really like to see studies being done. And the studies that need to be done are those that look into whether the genome of recipients of vaccines have has changed. And you can yes. find these snippets of DNA in a foreign DNA in the genome of recipients. Correct. Yes. And so, you know, I, I don't think we don't want to like make people afraid. And I know that Bill Buckles, that he, he didn't want that either. I think it's just very important to say why we need to look into it because of the theoretical concerns. And, you know, he seemed more worried about the cancer issue because that's his specialty. And he mentioned the um, the autoimmune potential, you know, the the potential that it could start autoimmune diseases as well. And so, you know, I, I think we don't want people going around speculating that maybe this has happened to them when it hasn't. I, and that's why I just really, you know, and or uh, when it maybe hasn't, right? When, when maybe this isn't even a concern. And so that's, I think, really why we need the FDA to really say, you know, we need to do these studies to see if this is happening because, you know, that should be their job to, to make sure um that the, the the products that they're approving are 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 safe and so it's really just disappointing to me that they they are not you know asking Pfizer and Moderna to look into this or making sure that these studies are done um and and so yeah I mean I was just gonna say that if if people are interested in doing the study I do wonder if it's going to have to be independent scientists that do it and i i know that they they should reach out to us because i know that there are some people who may be able to help uh get funding or to help make the study happen if people are able to do it but but yeah um so i guess we we can leave that topic at that because it's it's not my it's not my specialty either you know um but i think i think we under we understand enough to understand the concern and the biggest concern, uh, you know, is like, you know, why was why was this not caught before? And people can listen to Sasha Ladapova talking about if you're not familiar with her, she talks a lot about how why the regu regu regulatory oversight of these vaccines was suboptimal because of the quick process that she calls it sort of the militarized process of the the um, rollout of the vaccines that we just didn't have the regular regulatory oversight that we normally have. And, and so, you know, I guess that, that, that goes, you know, for, 
the entire world because obviously no other people in other countries and regulators in other countries didn't discover this problem either. So it makes me reflect on the fact that, you know, I, I do think that the 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 EMA and, and, and you know, and, and Europe and, and Canada and South America, like, you know, rely on the FDA um, and in part to do, you know, their to to regulate to make sure that the vaccines are safe and effective. I mean, how do you feel about that? Curious to get your take. Well, I think the different regions have their own oversight committees or oversight bodies in at like the EMA you mentioned. So I don't think EMA depends on FDA. And I think the regulatory process in fact was delayed in Europe compared with in the US in the first place because uh, FDA went with the emergency approval and EMA decided, no, we want to have like more a full type of approval. So mm -hmm. I don't think the rest of the world depends on FDA, but of course we we look towards FDA and and everybody, all, I think this is an issue for all the regulatory bodies all over the world. And I yeah. hope there will yeah. be a very speedy process now of cleaning up this uh, safety signal, which hopefully, and again, we should emphasize there are many reasons why it's a theoretical risk and why we cannot in any way conclude anything based on what has been uh, put forward so far. But but clearly it raises a concern that both of you share and where we have this feeling that there's only one right thing to do and that is to, to study it as quickly as possible and be as transparent as possible. But I think the, the main reason may have been that the actual threshold for, uh, for DNA wasn't reached, but nobody considered that that threshold might be different for the mRNA vaccines. Um, right. so yeah, which well, is interesting. Uh, well, yeah, <laughs> that, that no one, no more. one would knew that. Knew that it's like kind of disappointing. We yeah. should really have our best scientists on, <laughs> on on cases like this where it's being rolled out to the entire world, you know. Um, but anyway, <laughs> yeah, I think we we uh, but none of us are experts. We have we know enough to be concerned, and we know enough to really encourage more research. Uh, but uh, we also want to say that people shouldn't freak out and uh, until we have more information because there are all these different steps towards that potential worst case scenario that needs to be fulfilled for it to happen. Exactly. So let's move on to, to talking about the uh, the hepatitis B vaccine. That's what we uh, have on the discussion list next. So that's a vaccine that uh, interests me a lot, yes, because you use it in the US in four doses in childhood, right? It's given at birth and then in three doses with the Diphtheria tetanus pertussis containing vaccines. That's that right. So? I well, well, you know, I have to double check that because I had it written down that it was at birth and one and six months. Um, and now I I realized I better, I maybe I'll I'll have to look that up to make sure I know the the exact dosing. But we do we do give it to all. It is recommended to be given to all, all newborns, um, and. And I think that's and, that's the issue that's really puzzling me because that's a decision that has been made in low income settings where you have a high risk of uh, liver cancer, which is the the disease that you want to protect against with the hepatitis B vaccine, um, and where you don't have a screening program, so you don't test pregnant women for whether they are carriers of this hepatitis B. So maybe we should just start out by explaining that hepatitis B vaccine is given at birth to prevent, or the idea at least uh, in low-income settings is that if a mother is a carrier of the hepatitis B virus, she can pass it on to her baby during the delivery and the baby can become a carrier of this hepatitis B virus and it can eventually develop liver cancer. Uh, so the idea of giving the vaccine right at birth to the baby or just within the first 24 hours is that if you do that, you can actually block that transmission from the mother to the baby and you can reduce the baby's risk of getting a hepatitis B uh, virus or become a carrier of hepatitis B virus and eventually of getting liver uh, cancer. So there are all good reasons for employing it in low income settings where you don't have a screening program for mothers and where you have a risk of, of uh, this transfer from the mother to the baby in connection with the delivery and, and you could prevent cases by giving hepatitis B vaccine immediately after birth. But I'm really puzzled when I learned that US 
uses this vaccine to every baby that's born because you have, uh, to my understanding, a screening program. And you don't need to give this vaccine, obviously, to children of mothers who haven't been, who aren't carriers of hepatitis B virus because the baby is not at risk of getting it from its mother. Um, so so maybe you can explain to me why was this uh, recommendation? Yeah, I mean, I, I, so I looking back at the history of it, it seems like the idea was that they really wanted to minimize to the greatest extent possible hepatitis B um, in the United States. And the, the idea was that if we could vaccinate everyone, that we would really reduce the overall prevalence of hepatitis B because, you know, potentially people who later in life tend to be higher risk um, because it's a sexually transmitted disease is transmitted through blood products may not get vaccinated and increase for that, you know, than the for that they wouldn't still need the birth dose you could just give it in doses later i mean um, some european countries use hepatitis b but they use it in the uh, pentavalent or six valent vaccine with diphtheria tetanus pertussis uh, hemophilus influenza that, that there's a combination vaccine that's given typically well in denmark at three five and 12 months of age it's this series of vaccines against diphtheria tetanus and other diseases where hepatitis b has been added to so you can give it as a, a one vaccine that contains six up to six different diseases and one of them being hepatitis b but in these these programs you also immunize children in some European countries, as I said, against hepatitis B, but it doesn't need to be a birth dose. The exact birth dose is given to prevent that transmission from the mother. So, exactly. so there yeah, seems to be no reason for it. That's that's it's a very good point. And so I I I was looking through the data, and there there actually is a Cochrane review of randomized studies of the hepatitis B vaccine. Um it, that includes the hepatitis B vaccine, um, uh, as well as, um, so there, there were four studies looking at the hepatitis B vaccine given in infants. And this, they, they were given to infants of um, hepatitis B positive mothers. And, and so they did end up finding that the vaccine um, did have an efficacy of about, they estimated 72%. Um, so this, you know, and they basically, you know, recommend, they, they said that they felt like there was good evidence that the, the vaccine was effective um, for infants um, at preventing the transmission from the mother. Um, the randomized controlled trials of the vaccines, they said, didn't have good information on side effects, though they did say that the one that did brought up an increased risk of otitis media and um, osteo or, it, it, or it, actually chronic arthritis, sorry, which I thought that those were the interesting things that were brought up. And I thought you'd be interested in that otitis media. But um, and then the other randomized study that I found, the initial study, because I think it's important to understand like what the really good studies are that we have of this uh, vaccine. And I should say there's two. There's the Merck vaccine and the Glasgow Smith Klein vaccine. The, the Merck vaccine was the first one, and it was um, in 1980 that there was a study in the New England Journal of Medicine looking at um, men who have sex with men, um, high-risk population in New York, and and so then they were able to find an 18 month study that it had over 90 percent efficacy um, and uh, they didn't find any safety concerns. But it was it was a study of just over it was a study of just over a thousand people, um, men. So these are adult men. And so, you know, the I don't know if the rationale for giving it at, at birth kind of comes from the fact that we had these trials. And baby in infants that got it at birth, these these randomized studies. Um, and then, you know, from there, I just don't see that we have good data on randomized data in 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 infants of non-positive mothers. And um I, I found it really hard to find information, um, like good information from good randomized trials, like not. It, about about the side effects and about the the benefits you know to to children who are not born to mothers who are positive and so 
I mean, like I said, I think it was like extrapolation. It was like, okay, we can, we can give it to these babies because we have some existing studies in infants and then it will provide them lifelong um, protection or that was the idea so that we don't need to rely on them getting vaccinated later. You bring up a great point that they could wait to do the, they could wait to give the vaccination later with other vaccines and you wouldn't need to give it to them as a newborn. And I, I imagine you're you're saying that because you're you're concerned about the about the side effects in the newborn. Is that correct? Absolutely, yes. So I'm you know, my main concern, and we've discussed it before, is that none of these vaccines were actually tested for their overall health effects. So the our current framework for testing and regulating and approving vaccines is based on the idea that the vaccine only induces specific protection against the vaccine disease. Then you look for efficacy and you then look for side effects within the first few weeks of the study uh, of the clinical trial leading to to approval and um and there is a judgment part included in that where you uh, look at the side effects and you judge whether they were related to the vaccine or not so basically there is this built in filter for events to be registered as related to as side effects. And, and also, there is no follow-up beyond the first weeks for uh, general morbidity. The side effects are typical adverse events are, uh, or adverse reactions, solicited adverse reactions are captured within the first weeks. And then afterwards in the clinical trials, there'll be uh, the, the registration of, of serious adverse events in terms of hospitalizations and death. Uh, but again, they are put on the weight of are they related, aren't they related? There will be this judgment of, of whether it's likely that they're related to the vaccine. And my issue here is that in many situations, myocarditis, for instance, occurring in uh, a single myocarditis in the phase three trials of the COVID-19 vaccines would immediately or be, be judged as not related to the vaccine before we knew better. So, so there is right. this problem with the what is plausible? Because of course we don't know what's plausible when we have a new vaccine, um, and and so this assessment of plausibility and and relatedness with the vaccine, I think, is is problematic. As is the point that the phase three trials also do not ask for other diseases. So there's not the understanding or the recognition that a vaccine against hepatitis B could potentially lead to more pneumonia with streptococci three months later, that if that happened, unless it was led to hospitalization or death, it wouldn't be registered in the clinical trials as they are now, which I find is highly problematic because we really know now very well that vaccines can affect the risk of other infections uh, and both very beneficially, but also sometimes negatively for some vaccines. So we need to have that full collection of data in the in the phase three trials that doesn't take place for the time being. So that's one of my concerns that the vaccines weren't investigated well enough before they were being implemented. And we are now in this catch 22 where many people will say, oh, but it would be unethical to do a randomized trial, a big randomized trial with many participants because now the vaccine is recommended. So would you want to withdraw it from some children? And I'll argue yet in the case of hepatitis B, it would be justified to withdraw it again for some children and do a randomized trial. But but we can come back to that. But I think that's that's the problem of not doing the homework well enough in the beginning when the vaccines are deployed. Then you get into these catch-22 situations where it becomes very difficult once a vaccine is recommended to actually test it properly. So that's why we should have the good trials right from the beginning. Unfortunately, they weren't done for hepatitis B vaccine. So I, I, I think like you, we are left in the dark with regards to the overall health effects of hepatitis B vaccine. And particularly uh, about the fact that we give it immediately at birth. And there I have to say, and, and it's terrible because I have to come with a disclaimer and say, I'm not a conspiracy theorist. I'm not against vaccines, etc. But I'm just, I have to say, I'm concerned by the fact that the hepatitis B vaccine contains aluminium as an adjuvant, and aluminium is uh, the only metal that is not in any living body on Earth. And this is why it's such a good adjuvant, because the body responds to it, and then you it, you can use it to give it with quite weak antigens in a vaccine to make a good antibody response. But 
in my assessment, and this is not my primary area of research, but I just don't see any reason for injecting alum in a newborn baby uh, because there have been signals of neurotoxicity uh, related to aluminium and there's this huge discussion going on and again I'm not an expert on whether are these doses sufficient uh, to create neurotoxicity can the alum injected in the vaccine pass the blood-brain barrier have these uh, studies that have seen alum being neurotoxic can, can they be extrapolated to make us understand or give any suspicion that? And in my view, yes, I think that the jury is still out. I'm, I'm not sure we can exclude, or I, th I know we cannot exclude, that giving these injections containing alum very early in life, where the newborn is, particularly children with low birth weight and so on, may have more leaky barriers between also the blood and the brain, et cetera, whether that's harmless. Uh, so. So given when we look at benefit risks, that there is no benefit of vaccinating a child of a hepatitis B negative mother with hepatitis B vaccine right at birth. And given that there is a potential risk that hasn't been completely, and again, we are talking theoretical risks, but we need to have these theoretical risks debunked or you know disproven when we talk about vaccines that we give to millions of healthy children, then then I think that there is a, a very good case for discussing in the US whether hepatitis B vaccine should be recommended at birth. Right. And and so I, I do want to say that I there there is equipoise about this topic, right? Because the US recommends it for infants. Most of Europe does not, correct? And so that 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 means that we really, you know, it it would be ethical to do a randomized trial. We can do a very large randomized trial um, and answer these questions. You know, you can uh, you can have a long follow up, as as you say, and and you can follow them through all of childhood, and then you know plan. You know, if they're in, if the if you then you can unrandom, unblind or whatever at some point years later and say, you know, because, you know, it, the risk in children who are not born to, to, um, you know, moms who are positive is, is very low. And so I, we could do what Europe does, right? And then um, you can, you can wait, you can wait on giving that vaccine and compare these randomly assigned groups of, of babies and then children and, and look at outcomes like the risk of other infections and look at other, you know, neurological endpoints and we would have an answer and you know or at least you know you never can completely rule out very very rare things but we would have a better answer we would have better informed consent for parents because you know right now i i look at the data and i really i don't have an answer i feel like i couldn't i mean uh you know and in, in denmark i didn't have to make the decision because it wasn't offered you know to 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 um my son but you know i I, I I feel like looking at the data now, I, I I just don't I don't feel like I have enough information either to make it for myself or to guide someone else and how to make the decision about an infant uh, other than to say, you know, I don't think that we have the data to show that the benefits outweigh the the harms. I, I don't think that we have that at this time. And so I think, you know, in the US, if they want to really recommend it, to all infants, they really, you know, the burden should be on them to do the trial so that, you know, parents can make informed decisions. And and I want to get to this aluminum thing because, uh, you know, I've heard a lot of um, ex va vaccinologists, vaccine experts talk about this issue and talk about how, you know, we're exposed to aluminum through our diet, you know, all the time. Um, and, and that the dose that we get in vaccines is very low. And, and I, I understand that your concern and the concern of also many people is that this it's injected. And so that's, you know, a different way of, of administering the aluminum. And, you know, I don't know if you're able to talk about that a little more, but I know that there's just kind of a lot of, there's two camps on this issue. There's like, the people who say don't worry about it at all because we have aluminum in our diet and we're fine and you can't avoid it. And then there's the people who say, but injecting the aluminum is different 
um, and it can ha cause neurotoxicity. And personally, I've I've had trouble getting an answer about whether or not that is true or disproving it. You know, um, I so I, I'd be curious to hear your your take on that if you have thoughts. So I think maybe we should consider having a guest or two in our podcast at some stage because this is not my area, and I mm -hmm. I don't want to say anything that I uh, uh, where where I'm insecure about because i share i share your uh, understanding or a perception that this is this is something where there are two camps i've heard people i trust say that this uh, alum differs in and it definitely does there are many different formulations of alum and they are different whether you ingest ing you eat them or you inject them and even in the injectable forms there are different variants so it's not that alum is not just alum, uh, and the really important, or one of the very important aspects here, I think, is about the the ability of that formulation to pass the blood brain barrier. But it could be fun. Uh, I think we should stop here now for, for time reasons also. But but it could be fun at some stage to invite a guest in the podcast and discuss uh, an expert or several experts on aluminium, preferentially some who have different views on this. And discuss yeah. what uh, what uh, what what is at stake and why whether we should be concerned or not. I have this gut feeling that there's reason for concern, but I'm not. Uh, I don't have much expertise. Well, I think that would be really fun, and I hope someone reaches out to us, or <laughs> maybe we find someone who is an expert in this topic, because I do think that there's a I, there's a lot of interest in understanding more about it, and. You know, I, I will say that, you know, even if we have a guest on who says, oh, yes, you know, it is really a potential risk and I'm concerned, we, you know, we still don't have the answer because we're still here without any any data, you know, that that we, 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 we can't say there are harms. We can't really say that there aren't like this amount of number because we just really don't have good randomized trials in that were done in infants with any sort of follow up. We have these really small trials that were you know, with short follow-up that were done. Well, the hepatitis B vaccine, you mean? The hepatitis B vaccine yeah. in the, then the positive the, moms and then some observational studies that I've heard were, you know, very short um, in, 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 in small in, in size. Um, and, and that's, that's just not, not enough. To go I should on. mention so that we have, uh, I mean, to my concerns, at that we had a study in Guinea-Bissau where we used hepatitis B vaccine as a challenge vaccine. So within a randomized trial of measles vaccine, uh, children got hepatitis B vaccine at seven and a half months of age. And this was in a population that doesn't normally receive hepatitis B vaccine uh, or didn't do it at that time. So um, what, what we saw was that when we compared mortality during the period where hepatitis B was used in the seven and a half to 12 months old children versus mortality rates in the younger children who weren't exposed to hepatitis B, then we could see that in the period where hepatitis B was used, there was an increase in mortality in the period where hepatitis B vaccine was used. And it was particularly for the girls. Uh, and also during this period, girls had significantly higher mortality than males, and they didn't have it before or after and in the ages uh, before the hepatitis B vaccine. So it's an ecological study. It's not a direct comparison of hepatitis B versus hepatitis B unvaccinated children. In It wasn't a randomized trial on hepatitis B vaccine, but it is the uh, only study that we have been able to do where we looked at hepatitis B vaccine and the effect on overall mortality. And hepatitis B vaccine followed the pattern we've seen for other non-live vaccines. So it increased uh, overall mortality and it was particularly for the females. So for me, it's another reason for concern. It's a signal that this vaccine may also have these uh, negative non-specific effects that we've seen for other non-live vaccines in the African yeah. context. So oh, so I I'm just really wanted to that. throw that study and I can put a reference to it in the in the notes yes, for the podcast. Yeah, that would be good. Uh, yeah, I hadn't I hadn't seen that. So yeah, so that's, so that is concerning. That's mostly concerning, you should say, then in a low income setting, clearly, where we have the high infectious disease pressure. But it is an yeah, again, a signal that there are things about these vaccines that wasn't that weren't investigated properly before they were launched. And, and particularly just coming back to alum, 
I think the issue we are fighting here is that there's now an almost 100 year old tradition of using alum, which in, in itself becomes for some people an argument that it's safe. And I don't think we can uh, we can define that or to be reassured about that just because it's been used for a long time. Because the problem was that the standards to which the, it was tested 100 years ago were not the standards that we would apply today. But, but after it kind of became accepted as an adjuvant, a safe adjuvant, and, and was used in vaccines, it has then become, in many studies, the placebo of choice, which I find is also highly problematic. So when you then are developing new vaccines, you, I think you also mentioned uh, it to me that the hepatitis B vaccine was tested not against a saline placebo, a neutral placebo, but it was tested against alum as the control group. Yes, and, and exactly. So you kind of defined a, a, a product which is considered safe and neutral. And I'm not sure we can conclude that, but once that has been established, it has been used then as a control for vaccine trials. And then you are basically comparing a new vaccine against something that you don't understand the full effect of. And that is uh, also uh, why I think both randomized trials of hepatitis B vaccine uh, are needed, but also a better understanding of what is it actually that the alum adjuvant does because it's implied in so many vaccines and it was implied in so many vaccine testings as a placebo. Right. So, yeah, I mean, I, that, that brings up a great point that we, you know, if we did, if that randomized control trial is done, that they should not uh, make the placebo uh, have alum in it, that Absolutely. it should be, you know, I mean, one can talk a lot about what the best placebo is, you know, to give, the impression that, that you know the baby was given the vaccine but in this in this and when it comes to infants it's like if you put a needle in their arm they're going to cry either way so you know do you do you really need anything other than saline i think you could argue in this case that saline would do because you know they'll just cry you know it wouldn't matter yeah. what you give them so, <laughs> um well yeah anyway this has been another great discussion it um, has tracy lovely talking with you and we will continue with uh other vaccines, other differences between the U.S. and the Danish vaccination program and uh, with our, yes. we will continue. We, we are not experts in everything we discuss, like I think it was evident from this podcast, but we share our curiosity. We share that we are not scared of asking questions and discussing all kinds of aspects of vaccines. And uh, uh, I think that's that's what I also based on the feedback that we get from this podcast, this is uh, something that people have been looking for because this debate has been so close, it's been so polarized, and it hasn't been possible to have these open, curious discussions. So I really exactly. appreciate our talks and, <laughs> uh, and we'll continue. Yeah, I hope people realize it doesn't have to be adversarial. You know, it can be sort of a fun challenge to look through the data and, and that's exactly what, what, you know, what we're doing. And so we hope people reach out with comments and feedback. And I know a lot of people are waiting for the HPV vaccine episode. So, you know, we really need to do that. And a couple of people have reached out saying they might, you know, want to be a guest. And so we'll, well, anyway, we'll, uh, we'll figure that out. To be the continued. Next yeah. Yes, exactly. <laughs> to be continued. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.